How many of you are blessed by that? There is a reason why I asked Wesley if you can share that testimony. Because that was his journey. We celebrated our graduates who gets to celebrate a milestone in their journey. But the truth of the matter is we are all on a journey in life. You see, sometimes we see people in their destination and know nothing about their journey. We see people in their outcome and don't know what they had to come out. We see people in their work but know nothing about their war. You see, the title for today's sermon, the title for today's sermon is, For Wherever There Is Work, There Will Be War. Now, this is not a message of doom and gloom. This is reality. Because the truth of the matter is, we all have an assignment on our life. The enemy couldn't stop you from coming to Jesus. But if he can come and stop your assignment, so that others will not come to him, that's what he's on a mission to do. Jesus says the enemy come not but to do what? To steal, to kill, and destroy. Do you think you're going to operate in your calling and live your life to benefit people so that they can come to know Jesus and the enemy is just going to sit back and watch? He is after your assignment. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the enemy is after your assignment but good news he can't touch it you got to keep going come on look to another neighbor and say neighbor it could be hard right now but you got to push through the pain so you can walk in your purpose come on somebody give God praise for wherever there is work when I say work I'm talking about the assignment I'm talking about the purpose. God says, I know the purpose that I have for you. I know the plans. I know the thoughts. He didn't just put you here to exist. There are things he wants to do in you and through you. You have a purpose. You have a work to do here. You see, Wes can touch people that I can't touch. I'm not an engineer. If somebody came to me and asked them to help them make music, I couldn't help them. But I've been through my things that I've been through where I can touch people. Each and every one of us have a, 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 a world of people that God has called you to. But where there is work, there will be what? War. Now, let me tell you, this is through the Bible. I said, Lord, you got to break this down for me. And he began to walk me through the people he used that were very influential in life. And you look at the moment they stepped into their work, immediately there was war. You remember Daniel, God, the people of, of, of Israel, they were exiled into Babylon. And God had put people in place to do his work even though they were in exile. You see how Wes said, sometimes it's in the lowest place that God will reveal what he's called you to do. There's work to do. And the Bible says in Babylon, this might be too small for you to read, but I'll read it to you. In Daniel chapter 6, it says, then, then, then this Daniel distinguished himself above, somebody say above, above the governors and satraps. This is in a Babylonian land. Daniel was not from Babylon, but, but he extinguished himself in his work above all the other people because he had an excellent spirit. Excellent spirit is referring to his work ethic. Though Daniel was in a rough place, he didn't let that stop him from giving God his best. I was talking to my sister yesterday, Sister Davis, and she said, Josh, I just love God so much. And whatever he tells me to do, I'm going to do it with everything I got. I'm going to bring high faith. I'm going to do it with a spirit of excellence. Why? Because he's worthy of the praise. Amen. It says Daniel had an excellent spirit. And because of his work ethic, look what the underline says. It says, and the king gave thought to setting him over the entire realm, the entire region. Daniel is not a native of Babylon, but he's being promoted above everyone else because he was working, but not just working. He was working for God. There's work. 
Look at the very next verse, verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find charge against him. There's war. They, they, they wanted to find a charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But look at this. But they could find no charge or fault because he was what? Faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. So because they couldn't attack his character, they had to attack his faith. That sounds like an enemy we face today. They had King Darius sign a decree that if anyone prays to anyone except Darius or the God he serves, that person ought to be put in the lion's den. That sounds like a rough place. But the Bible says Daniel still went to the window, opened the window, and prayed three times a day. He continued with his work. Amen. Another example is Joseph. All Joseph did was have a dream. You can't even dream nowadays. You can't even believe God for something big. That's all he did. He had a dream. God showed him, this is the work I'm going to do through you. Because a famine is coming that people don't know about. The people are in Egypt, but God is like, I need to preserve my people in this famine. And so he was going to raise Joseph up so that Joseph can preserve God's people so they won't die in a famine. So God showed him his work, and immediately after God showed him his work, what was there? War. The Bible says, now Joseph had a dream, and he told his brothers, and they hated him even more. He just had a dream. If you know the story of Joseph, the dream he had, the work he was going to do, was going to save them too. But you got to be careful. There's some small-minded people out there. They don't realize that the calling you have is for them too. And so they don't want to see God raise you. I heard someone say, if you want to tell your big dream to die, just tell it to a small-minded individual. Amen? David was, be I mean, Joseph was betrayed. And he found himself in a cistern, in a pit. Then sold to slavery. He could have given up. But no, the Bible says he continued in his work. Somebody say, he continued in his work. We know three Jewish boys named uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but they were given Babylon Babylonian names. What were those names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, they were in exile too, and God gave them work to do in exile. But look how immediately there was war. It says, but some of the astrologers went to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and informed him on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue. When they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and pipes, and other musical instruments, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into what? A blazing furnace. But watch this. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the providence of Babylon. Now, that speaks to the fact that they were in government. Why were they in government in a foreign land? Because of their work. God was promoting them. But now here comes other people to say, they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Now, when they stood before the gold statue and given one more chance to bow, did they bow? Did they bow to the demands of the people? Did they, did they bow to what the culture said was the right thing to do? What did they do? They stood for Jesus. Amen? There was war. But I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, no matter how people plot against you, no matter how the enemy wants to come and stop your assignment, the moment you decide, I'm, I'm going to serve God and God alone, he will, he will protect you and show you. He's still faithful. He's going to protect you regardless. But you will see that your faith is not in vain. The Bible says that, that anything you do for the Lord is never in vain. Wes could have given up on that album, but the reason why he's able to be celebrated today, because even when he was in the midst of war, he continued to do God's work. I don't know what challenges you're facing right now. Maybe on the job. Maybe there's people coming against you. Maybe it's challenges in your health. Maybe it's challenges in your finances. Whatever it is the enemy is trying to use to stop you from doing your work, I'm here to tell you, keep working. 
keep working because you will see that the battle belongs to God. Come on, somebody. That, that, that God deserves a better praise than that. The victory belongs to you because the battle belongs to him. Don't let that stop you. Don't let your circumstances stop you from doing what God called you to do. Some of you, you put your work down because there was too much going on and, 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 and you're busy and you, and, and you may have some excuses that are, are relevant. But I'm here to tell somebody today that your breakthrough is in your work. Keep showing up. Somebody say that to your neighbor. Neighbor, keep showing up. Keep showing up. Remain faithful. Look to another neighbor and say, neighbor, walk with an excellent spirit. Walk with an excellent spirit. You serve a big God. He's called you to do big things. Keep showing up, brothers and sisters. Don't put your work down because there's something on the other side that you will see will bless you. Psalms 30 says, weeping may endure for a night. But joy, come on somebody, joy will come in the morning. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep trusting. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep walking. And I will not let my circumstances dictate my praise. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? And you got to be careful because it's not just walking, but it's also talking. You got to be careful that you're saying what God says about you. Amen? Amen? Stop saying what the world says. There's no jobs. The economy is bad. It will never happen. No, say what God says. Once I was young, but now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, And my God, my God, my God, remember you got to make it personal. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory that is in Christ Jesus. I know what the doctor says. I know what the prognosis is. But he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes I'm healed will you say what you believe even if it's contrary to what you see will you say what you believe even if it's contrary to what you see because we walk by faith and not by sight faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not yours just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. You just got to keep walking and keep believing and keep trusting. And soon you will see that God already made a way. Even if you have to take breaks. Wes had to take a break after every word and sit down. But he didn't let that stop him from walking in his assignment. He's, he was in the middle. Wherever there is work, there was what? War. War. He was fighting for his life. If that's not war, I don't know what is. But he says, I'm going to keep showing up for God. He gave me this assignment, and I believe that he who began a good work is faithful. Come on, somebody, look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got a work to do. You better keep working. You got work to do, neighbor. Keep working. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible says in Ephesians 3 and 20 that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than anything you can ask or imagine. I told Sue this morning, I hear people quote that a lot and stop there. It's beautiful. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than all we can ask or imagine. Read the rest of the verse according to the power that is at work in you don't forget that god is including you in the work he has promises for you but we have skin in the game he's looking for faith amen remember the centurion the centurion came to jesus and said to the jesus he says no you don't need to come to my house to heal my servant just send your word hallelujah just send your word because i'm a man of commands as well i know what it means to receive an order and i gotta go not only that i have people who are subject to me if i say go i know they'll go and so just send your word and my servant will be healed the bible says this is a roman soldier jesus looked around and said i have not seen faith 
like this in all of Israel. Sometimes you just need a word and you take that word and go do your work. God may not tell you everything he's going to do for you. Amen. He'll just give you a word. And, you're going to, and we were going to see, will you stand on my word? Will you step out on my word? I'm encouraged by, by Abram. Abraham, the Bible says, when his name was Abram in Genesis 12, God said to him, Abram, leave your father's house and your country. It's one thing to just relocate from one city to the next. He said, no, leave your father's house and your country and go to a land that I will show you. David, Abram left his house with no coordinates to put in his GPS, but he stepped out on God's word. The Bible says the very next morning, he stepped out and left. And eventually God showed him what he had for him. That's when the covenant happened. He says, Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. If you know the history I went and studied, he had to leave his father's house. They served for other gods. His destiny couldn't happen. Sometimes God got to pull you out of the unfamiliar and so that you can see who he's called you to be. He has to change everything on the outside just to show you who you are on the inside. The same thing happened with Moses. So if I, I'm speaking to somebody because this is not in my notes, but somebody, you're in an uncomfortable place right now. And you're feeling like, I, did I do something wrong? Why am I in such a place? I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to stand on God's word. God, I believe you called me here. Why does it seem like nothing is working? Sometimes God has to bring you out to show you not only who he, who he is to you, but he wants to show you who you are in him. Think about Moses. Moses was Hebrew. He was born a Hebrew, but he was raised an Egyptian. And so he found home in the Egyptian, but the, if you read it, he was having an identity crisis because he would go and visit the Hebrews. And so he would go out and he saw them fighting, and when they were fighting, he intervened. And when he went back to the palace to live an Egyptian life, the next day he went out to the Hebrews and saw more fighting. And what did they say? Who, who put you in charge of us? Are you going to kill me the way you killed the, um, the Egyptian yesterday? Amen. And the Bible, say, and the Bible says he left and ran because he knew that if Pharaoh found out he killed an Egyptian, his life would be in, there, in danger. And now he is in the land of Midian. He's not with the people he was born to be. Or the people he grew up to be. He was with somebody, people that he didn't even know. He was with the Midianites. And one day God showed up to him in the midst of his identity crisis. Do you know the word Midian is interpreted from the word, it's uh, translated from the word judgment. It's so interesting to me because he was in a land of judgment. And I'm sure he felt judged by the Egyptians and judged by the Hebrews. And if you look at his conversation with God, he lost his confidence. He was the prince of Egypt. He lost his confidence because God says, Moses, Moses. And Moses came. He said, remove your sandals for where you are standing is holy ground. He says, Moses, I called you. you probably, Moses probably wouldn't have heard the voice of God if he was still in the palace. He says, I called you to deliver my people. And Moses had a, he had a moment where he says, God, I'm not the guy. I'm not the man for the job. I can't even speak. I can't even speak. And it reminds me again of what Wes said, in the lowest moment, God just has a way, like it just, his ways are truly not our ways. How do you call somebody who can't speak and tell them they're going to be your spokesman? God knows how to find you in your most humble state but he can use you right there because everything you do from that moment forward you're depending on him don't let the discomfort stop you from doing your work there is no comfort in the growth zone just like there's no growth in the comfort zone if God has pulled you out of your comfort zone maybe he's, he's doing something in you so he can do through you Amen? When you think about somebody who was fixated on the work, look at the life of Jesus. Jesus' life was short-lived. 33 years. He didn't start his ministry until 30. But if you look at Jesus, he was always talking about 
his father's work. Now, Jesus was known for another type of work. He never referred to it. How many of you know what industry his family was in? It's a carpentry. Joseph was a carpenter. And people were do, tried to reduce him to that because remember when, when Jesus was out and he was doing his ministry, he came back home to minister. And people were marveled at the things he said and what they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? And what did Jesus say? A prophet is not welcome even in his own home. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, don't let nobody put a title on you. Don't let nobody put a title or try to reduce you. You are who God says you are. You will do what God says you will do. Amen? And so Jesus was fixated on the work of his God. But the, the, what, as soon, wherever there is work, there will be what? Jesus finally, after 30 years, is going to start his ministry. And the first thing he was going to do is go get baptized by his cousin John. And then he went to fast. He's about to start his ministry and now he's stepping into his father's work. And it says in Matthew 4, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, that takes a lot of work, right? When he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Very next verse. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God. He's about to step into his work and immediately there's war. I heard a pastor say, you got to think about this. The enemy was so scared because the pastor says, I believe reading the text that the devil was there watching him for 40 days. And when he concluded the fast and was getting ready to start the work, that's when he showed his face. Now, if you, if you, if you read, there is a hierarchy in angels, just like there's a hierarchy in in the, in the enemy's kingdom. What it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and, and, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. These are rankings. But when Jesus was getting, getting ready to start his, fat, um, his ministry, he, the devil didn't send a demon. He came himself. The tempter came because he knew this was trouble. And the Bible says the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in you. That's why the moment you wake up, he tries to bring war. And, and, and if you're not careful, you think the war is because of something you're doing wrong. No, it's the enemy trying to stop you from doing your work. If he didn't mess with you, then you had something to worry about. But the fact that he's been trying to cause trouble in your home, trouble in the job, trouble wherever you are, it tells you you might be carrying something he's afraid of. Brothers and sisters, do the work. Somebody say, do the work. The enemy came and one of the temptations, he told him to jump off of a cliff. For the Bible says, in Psalm 91, it does say word for word that he gives his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Amen? The Bible says that. Don't let the devil know the Bible better than you. Amen? But Jesus says, for it is written. Jesus knew he was about to do his work. You see, the devil messed up because the devil thought Jesus was stepping into his work and he's now finding his assignment, I believe. But what, he, what, what we remember is Jesus knew his work from when he was a child. Because the Bible says when he was 12, his family traveled for a festival. And, and he was amongst the religious leaders. And he would talk to them about the laws that predated him. And even the religious leaders were like, who is this young man? And how does he have so much wisdom? The festival ended and all the travelers went back. And I, I'm just like, coming from a, a Caribbean household, I just can't, I'm just like, can't imagine being in Jesus' place here. The family got back home, and his parents got back home, and all the travelers are getting into their house, and even when night comes, Jesus is not there. Wait a minute, everyone is back. Where is Jesus? Is Jesus at your house? Where is Jesus? The Bible says, <laughs> this is why I get nervous, they went and traveled and looked for him for three days. It's imagine you doing that to a stunt like that with your parents. For three days, they're looking for you. But look at this. It says Luke 2, verse 48. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? 
Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why do you seek me? Do you not know that I'm about what? My father's business. The Bible says they did not understand this statement which he spoke to them. Jesus was talking about his work. I'm about my father's work. Amen? Jesus, because he knew what his assignment was in his three years of ministry, we're still celebrating the finished works of the cross over 2,000 years later. And there's going to be times where you feel like giving up on your work. God, this is too much for me. This is too much to handle. Anybody ever just think about what it is God called you to do and suddenly you feel overwhelmed? It looks like it's too much. <laughs> I got two hands in the back going up. Amen? And, and you see the bigger picture and you feel overwhelmed. Just know that where God guides, he provides. Wherever he guides, he provides. Because even when Jesus was in the middle of the Garden of Gethsemane, and it says he, he knelt and he prayed, he was overwhelmed even to the point of anxiousness. Amen? He was overwhelmed. And the Bible says that he, when he even was sweating, he was sweating drops of blood. That's how stressed and overwhelmed he was but what did he say nevertheless not my will but thine he decided that even in the midst of war I'm going to continue with the work amen I want to read one scripture for you before we close I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 4 Matthew chapter 4. Let me know when you dare. Sorry, I apologize. John, John chapter 9. Please excuse me. John chapter 9. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. If you dare, say amen. amen. Verse 1 says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, then he, then he, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that what? The what? The works. Somebody say, the works. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me. He says, why? Because he says that I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For night is coming. What do you think he was speaking of? He was speaking of death. When you look at the word works in here, it comes from the Greek word ergon, which means what? What's that first word? Business, employment, that which one is an occupied, any product, whatever, any, what, uh, any product, whatever, anything accomplished by the hand, art, industry, or mind. This is from the strong concordance. But any assignment on your life, that's the work God called you to do. He says, and you have to do it while it is still day. Why? For night is coming. Jesus knew that there was a time frame on the assignment he was put here to do. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it says for everything there is a, a season, a purpose for everything under the sun. Look at these two words that are put in the same sentence. Season represents time because season has a beginning and season has a what? An end. To, to everything there is a season a time frame a purpose for everything under the sun there's a purpose you are carrying but there's a season attached to that purpose we are not here forever do what you what, do what God called you to do while you're here to do it 
I heard someone say, for every opportunity of a lifetime, there's a lifetime to that opportunity. I want to pray for everybody in here because there is a work to do. There's a lot of work to do. You can just look out there. You can look at, you can watch the news. There's a lot of work to do. Now is not the time for the church to be silent. Because there's people who are on track and don't even know that they're headed towards destruction. But God has an assignment on your life. And now is the time to step out to do the work. Amen? Let me tell you, work is not just for those who are standing behind a pulpit. This is just one form of things to do. On your job, there's a work to do. The Bible says Daniel was on the job and he operated with an excellent spirit. That God promoted him. There's a work to do because people will see your excellence and, want, and know there's something different about you. Guess what? That's a door that's open for them, you to share Christ. Maybe you're not in school. Maybe you're not in, on the job. Maybe you're in school. In school, there's a work to do. Other students need to know that there's a God. Amen? If you're at home full time, in home, there's a work to do. What uh, uh, pastor used the illustration, and I don't remember it was from uh, who, was, who, who preached it, but they said, whatever you're doing in life, do it so they can see what Jesus would look like doing what you do. Amen? If you're an accountant, show everybody in the accounting department what Jesus would look like as an accountant. Amen? Whatever your assignment is, if you're a teacher, teach in a way that people will see what Jesus would be like if he was a teacher right now. Operate in a spirit of excellence and keep doing the work. Amen? I want to pray because I feel like somebody who's probably facing, dealing with war right now. Maybe there's, maybe there's everything that's trying to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Because the purpose of the war is to stop you from doing your work. But well, we got to make a decision. I'm going to keep going. Somebody, can somebody just put their hand, hand in the air and just declare that? Say, Lord, come what may. I'm going to do what you called me to do. And I thank you that you will never leave my side. Hallelujah. Just keep that hand right there. Father God, I pray for each and every person here. Lord, I thank you that each and every one of them, you've given them a purpose, a calling. There's an assignment on their life. There's a work for them to do. And some of them, they, in their heart's desire, the Bible says you know the hearts of the people. And you can see in their heart that they want to do the work. But Lord, they are dealing with the war. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that as they focus on the work, you will fight their war. And that whatever the enemy may try to do to stop their assignment, we come against them now in the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you that God, wherever there's attack, wherever there's, there's, there's trouble or calamity, in the name of Jesus, we say, peace be still. Lord, the disciples were in a boat to cross the sea. You told them to cross to the other side. And in the middle of them obeying your word, there was war. For the Bible says even the ocean, the lake, the water, the winds rose up against them. But God, you stepped in and you spoke to the storm and you say, peace be still. And they were able to continue with the work. Father God, step into the lives of your children. Wherever there is a storm raging, if it's in their finances, their health, if it's in their relationships, if it's in their, in their memory, even right now, I hear the Lord, somebody, the Lord is dealing with someone's mind. Somebody, you, you, you're, you're, you're worried about your mind. You've been troubled in your mind, and you feel like you're not as sharp as you used to be. I even hear memory, like somebody, you probably, you're having trouble remembering things. I believe God is restoring you right now in the name of Jesus. In fact, let us all put our hands on our minds because that's where the enemy comes to attack you. He attacks your mind. He sows seeds of doubt. He sows seeds of, of worry. He tries to get you to, to any, he'll, he'll distract you so that you can focus on anything except for what you were called to do. But right now, the Lord is restoring somebody's mind. Say, that's my mind. Hallelujah. Somebody declare, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ.
Come on, somebody, open your mouth right now. Say, I have the mind of Christ. Somebody say, Lord, you did not give me a spirit of fear, but power, love, a sound mind. Come on, say, I have a sound mind. Come on, somebody declare, I have a sound mind. Somebody let the devil know, devil, you can't have my mind. My mind belongs to Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I have power. I have love. I have a sound mind. Hallelujah, a sound mind. The Bible says God will keep in perfect peace all those whose minds are fixed on him. Fix your mind on God. Come on, somebody say, God, my mind is on you. Lord, my mind is on you. Somebody declare it. My mind is on you. Therefore, I have perfect peace. I have perfect peace. My help comes from the Lord. Restore my mind, God. Come on, open your mouth. Restore my mind, God. Restore my mind. Restore my peace, oh God. Restore my peace, oh God. Restore my joy. Somebody, if you've been lacking joy and it's been hard to keep going and carry on, come on, somebody say, Lord, I have my joy. I have my peace. I have my mind. I have my mind back. I, I have the mind of Christ. Nothing will, nothing will trouble my mind. Hallelujah, I'm here in unclog. God is unclogging somebody's mind. When you think about a drain that has been backed up and nothing new can come in because the drain is clogged with things that shouldn't be there, I'm hearing God say, I'm unclogging somebody's mind so that my word can flow, that my power can flow, that the work can flow. God, I unclog their mind. Whatever the enemy put there, that they couldn't, they can't stand, they can't remember your word. They don't know what to say to pray. Their prayer life has been affected. God, I thank you. In Jesus' name, you are storing their fervor. You are storing their earnestness. The Bible says a, a fervent, earnest prayer of the righteous availeth much. God, I think you're restoring them right now. You're restoring their minds. That their minds are fixed on you. That they walk in perfect peace. That they can do their assignment. God, I thank you that the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will raise a standard against it. God, I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just worship him right there. Just thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Just worship right there. I feel like God is doing something right now. He's breaking something right now. Just worship him, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way in my mind, God. Have your way in my life, Jesus. Help me to do your work. Help me to do your will. Help me to do your will, Lord God. And everything that is standing in the way. Hallelujah. Everybody stand up where you are. Just stand up where you are. Because I'm asking the Lord to do this. And the Lord, I'm hearing, tell them to, to say it. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life is in the power of the tongue. And they that indulge in it shall eat the fruit thereof. I'm hearing that the Lord is saying that you, are, you have to open your mouth. And on the count of three, I want you to shout, move. Amen. The Bible says that, that God, it says, let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. And let those also who hate him flee before him. Sometimes you got to tell, I, we, we talked about Jesus in Matthew 4, when the enemy came in to try to attack him. Three times the enemy tried to create war. Each time he says, for it is written. But on the last time he said, away from me, Satan. And that's when Satan had to obey. So on the count of three, I want you to shout, move. And when you're saying move, you're telling whatever it is that's in your life, that's operating, that's stopping you from doing your assignment, that's stopping you from having the joy. The Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. You're going to tell it to go. Come on, somebody. You're going to tell it to go. Amen? But you got to say it with power and authority. For it is at work within you, the power of God. Amen? Amen. So often we speak to God, but sometimes we never speak to our situation. We got to learn that you open your mouth and you speak to your day. You speak to the situation. Amen? For you carry the power of God in the Holy Spirit. Amen? So on the count of three, I'm going to just ask Alonzo, if you could just give me something on the drums and just something, anything that just give me some a sound, whatever you want to play, just I need something just to fill the room. Amen? Come on, we're going to start by giving God a praise. Come on. We're going to start by giving God a praise. 
Yeah, we're going to set the atmosphere. We're setting the atmosphere because whatever it is that's been there, it's got to go. It's got to move. Whatever mountain, whatever wall of Jericho, as you open up your mouth, as you begin to praise, it's got to move. It's got to go. It can't stay. We can't stay where we're at. We got to move forward. We got to do the work. Come on, open your mouth just right now. Somebody just begin to open your mouth and let out your battle cry. Hallelujah. 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 God, we worship you, Lord. And as we're worshiping and letting a triumphant sound in this place, God, I thank you. I thank you that as we speak, Lord God, angels are on assignment. It's got to go. I'm, it's got to go. It's, it's got to go. It can't stay in your life. It can't keep keeping you. It can't stop you. It can't take your joy. It's got to go. It's got to go. It's got to go. Hallelujah. On the count of three, we're going to shout move. When we're going to shout it move, we're going to say it seven times. How many of you ready? How many of you ready? I'm seeing, I'm seeing the path that's opened up for people. I'm seeing paths open up. I'm seeing darkness moving and light is shining. I see somebody's red sea is getting ready to open up so you can march on to the other side. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. One. No, on three, you're going to shout move. Ready? One, two, three. Move. move. Come on. One, two, three. Move. move. One, two, three, move. move. Imagine it moving. One, two, three, move. move. Do it like this. One, two, three, move. move. Come on. One, two, three, move. move. Two more times. One, two, three, move. move. Last time, in Jesus' name. One, two, three, move. move. Come on, praise God. Praise Him, praise Him. It's got to go. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. In Jesus' name. It's gone. It's gone. Hallelujah. 